So I'm going to talk to you today about building and packaging modern C++ code, uh, modern C++ applications. Uh, this presentation won't have too much C++ code, uh, but it will focus on the environment, uh, some, some commands and tools used for uh, building. We will discuss faster building of code. We will discuss build environments, uh, packaging. So let's, uh, let's first uh, say a few words about who I really am. So Philip already gave me a good introduction. Um, I'm a, a software architect at, at Intel working on the integration of machine learning frameworks with, with the Habana hardware. Um, so, so those are hardware accelerator, accelerators for um, deep learning. Aside from that, I recently um, released a book called Software Architecture with C++. The contents of this presentation are related to one of the chapters of the book. So I hope it will spark some interest in you and uh, you will learn something new. And uh, I will say a few more words about uh, the book at the end of the presentation. So that's, uh, I think, enough about uh, me. Um, you can see some handles on the, on the slide. And uh, when I'm speaking about the book and this presentation, I cannot mention Piotr, who's not with us today, but who's the co-author and my uh, good colleague for a few years now. And um, he's uh, available for consulting, I believe. Uh, he's a, a very experienced uh, developer, not only C++ developer, Mm, he's an avid DevOps practitioner and also is uh, fluent in cloud technologies. Um, so without uh, further ado, I think uh, let's, uh, let's talk about the, the main topic or one of the main topics of the presentation, which is uh, building. So um, uh, not, a, not a concrete building, but uh, the building of software. And uh, I'm from Gdańsk, so obviously there are some cranes on the slide, uh, though uh, those are not the cranes that Gdańsk is famous for. Um, when talking about building, we will touch a few different subjects and we will start with one that's, uh, I think, uh, important for all the developers who ever build anything. And this is uh, speeding up the builds, uh, shortening the build time and the, the most basic and easy to introduce tool to speed up your builds is uh, Ccache. So I will cover it first. So in essence, Ccache is a compiler cache. So what it does, it, it gets the, it remembers the results of compilation. So the object files, and uh, if you recompile um, a source file, with the exact same compiler and flags, you will get a cached uh, object file instead of compiling a new one. So uh, let's talk, uh, let's say a few words about the features of uh, Ccache. So the main one and the reason why it's being used is that it offers much faster recompilation. And this is uh, for several languages. So Mainly it's used for C and C++ code, but aside from that, you can also use it with Objective-C code, Objective-C++, and uh, even with CUDA programs and assembly. So that's, that's the main uh, feature of it. And uh, it, to, to be better at it, it offers also compression. So the build artifacts are compressed so that you can fit more of them in the, in the precious uh, disk space that you allocated for Ccache. Uh, it also provides you with statistics so you can see exactly how often you get a cache hit and how often you need to recompile something. It also has uh, checksums for correctness since it's version 4.0. 
And uh, all of this is being done with, being done with uh, quite a low overhead. So um, this is really, th there is really almost no penalty if you have cash misses. And uh, if you call Ccash uh, in cases where uh, you cannot really cache the compilation result, for instance. So in unsupported cases, it just falls back to the native tool. So it also doesn't cost you much. And uh, a big pro of Ccache is that it uh, offers very easy integration with uh, whatever build uh, system you are using. And one of the lesser known features of Ccache and advantages, I believe, is that it already supports C++ 20 modules, although from what their documentation states, it's only for Clang and it requires setting a few options. To be frank, I haven't really played with that. Uh, so I only rely on the doc here. And uh, this is, uh, so, so when we are talking about what it supports, we also should say a few words about what environment it, it supports. And uh, it's actually multi-platform. So you can use it both on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows, among others. And uh, several compilers are supported as well. So you can use GCC, Clang, and NVIDIA's CUDA compiler with it. Um, MSVC support is still being done. You can track the progress of enabling it in the pull request that I posted. And uh, so, so on Windows, you can only use it with the other compilers. Um, and fortunately, it's pretty easy to install it. Uh, on Windows, you can just download the binaries from GitHub, the release binaries and, and use it. And for other systems, you can use the system package managers. So just apt install Ccash should, should do for Debian based distros, but usually you won't get the latest, greatest uh, Ccash. So maybe you won't get the um, checksum support or other features. So what I would recommend more is to use uh, brew or other non-OS related uh, package manager. So using brew, you can just type brew install Ccash and here you go. And if uh, you want to have the leading edge version of Ccash, you can also build from sources. It's a regular CMake project, so it shouldn't be that hard. And since I mentioned brew, let's uh, say a few words about uh, what actually this tool is and how it can help you. So basically, Brew is a package manager for macOS and Linux. Many people think it's only for macOS, but uh, I used it on Linux for quite some time, and I think it's, it's really a great way to provide you with the modern, up-to-date uh, versions of, of the software and tooling that you, could, uh, you would want to use. So why use it at all? If, if you want to have a, a, a recent version of, let's say, Ccash, then on Ubuntu, you, could, uh, you, you can't rely on the system package manager. Uh, so you could think that maybe Snap would be a way to go. And uh, the thing with Snap is that it really doesn't work with the Windows subsystem for Linux. And uh, even if it would work, it still has an old and unofficial version of, of Ccash. So last I checked, it was 3.7 and Brew offered 4.2. And uh, using uh, Brew, you also have this advantage that all files are, or all Brew packages are installed in one subtree. So by just adding it to the path or removing it from the path variable, you can enable or disable or all brew packages. And if you want, you can just uh, remove all the brew packages entirely by just removing a subtree in your operating system. On Windows, you can also use Scoop as an alternative to brew. 
And uh, speaking of other platforms and other ways to install, um, many of you, so it's an intermission in the intermission, many of you maybe not know that uh, you can just use pip to install some tooling for C++. So for instance, if you just type pip install CMake, uh, you can have a pretty recent version of CMake, even though your operating system probably offers you an older one. So uh, having said that, let's get back to, to Zcash and uh, how do you actually use it? So it's pretty simple actually. So to in you can either invoke it manually on a command line, just pass uh, Zcash, then the compiler like GCC and then the args. So the, the optimization options and the includes and the source files and etc. So that's one way. Another way is to use it through some symbolic links masquerading the compilers and i will show that in a second and uh, yet another way is to just integrate it with your build system and i prefer this way as it's the simplest one so speaking about masquerading compilers there's an easy way to ensure that ccache is used by default for all of your builds and uh, this is being done in two steps. So in the first step, you you should create uh, or, or copy the Zcash file into user local bin and then create in this directory um, links so that uh, if, if someone calls user local bin GCC, you, it will actually call Zcash. And then the tool would know uh, the the path of the to the executable that was originally called. In this case, the user local bin GCC, and it will know which compiler to run. But uh, usually, you don't uh, just type user local bin GCC. You just type the GCC. So the second step is just to put this user local bin early in your path, so that when you type GCC, this is the one that will get found. And uh, this is really all you need to do to use it by default. And uh, usually when you use it, you also want to configure something uh, so that it suits your needs better. And uh, the basic thing that you can... So, so basically there are two ways to configure Zcash. One is through the environment variables and the other is through a configuration file. So if I, I recommend using the latter. Um, uh, but in most cases, the default values work pretty well. Uh, if you want to configure something, here are a few um, settings that uh, you would uh, want to, to set. So the basic one is the cache size and location. And by default, it's just five gigabytes. So it might be not enough for your project to be built if, you're, if, if it's not uh, very small especially if you're building with debug symbols. Um, the other thing is that you can set the sloppiness. So this this uh, determines uh, how often Zcash will get uh, cache hits and how safe it will um, behave. So it, it, it's a scale. You have several settings that you can set. So uh, it's, it's pretty strict by default. So... Um, you you can so you can set uh, Zcash to use C times or M times to file instead of the file contents. So instead of calculating a hash from all the contents in a file, you can just check if it was modified and if if it was, then the compilation would be run. Also, if you want to work with C++ modules or pre-compiled headers, then using the sloppiness is also a good idea and the way to do so. Um, it also relates to how you pre-process uh, the header files um, or macros. Um, also, there are settings like the prefix command. So if you want to call yet another tool, by Zcash uh, before invoking the actual compiler, then prefix command is your friend. I will show you an example later on the slides. Also, there are a few settings that you can use for debugging, logging, um, tracing, and uh, basically checking what the tool is doing. 
So the read only mode can, can be handy for experiments. So in this mode, you just uh, use the files from the cache, but don't actually write any new ones. Okay, so that's enough about configuration. Let's talk about integration now. So if you want to integrate with, with it with CMake, if you have CMake 3.4 or a later one, you can just pass a, a variable to CMake uh, called, uh, so, so basically the CXX or C compiler launcher should be set to Ccache and that's all you need to do. And uh, if you want to use it, uh, not by setting a variable, but rather by, a de by detection from a CMake list file, then you could use this little snippet. So basically first you look if you have Ccache available on your OS, and if, it, if you do, then you set this uh, rule launch compile either globally or for some specific targets. Many people also set the rule launch link so they think that Ccache will uh, also remember linking results for them, but uh, this really doesn't work. Ccache only caches uh, compilation artifacts and it doesn't support linking. So um, now it's integrated with our CMake. Uh, what if we want to further increase the performance benefit it can offer us? So the main way is to just share the cache uh, between either different users or machines. So for instance, all of your CI, CD, pipeline builders could, could use the same cache. And uh, this way, the builds on your CI, CD should be really much faster. And uh, so, so you can either share the cache on the same machine or using a network storage. And this is the case for... for um, for the CI/CD, so if you have a few clusters, then you may want to provide uh, a few copies of the cache. So each location, like each each site of your company, has their own C cache, but it still should provide you with great benefits. If you want to share it between users, you must remember that the users are in the same user group so that they can all edit, uh, update the cache. And uh, you have to set some configuration variables. So the cache size should be greater. Um, the cache directory should be somewhere on a network share. The base directory, it, it allows different users uh, to share the cache so that they usually have different usernames. So you need to uh, tell Ccache that the, the part to their um, home directory, for instance, will differ. So it's the, the base directory. And then everything under that should be should be treated as the, the, the sh should be used to differentiate between different uh, compilation artifacts. Okay, so that's that's that. Um, the hash directory false, it's uh, for setting paths and debug symbols. And uh, oh, if, if you are using a network storage, then the temporary directory is something that you want to set so that you avoid uh, have some nasty bugs. So usually you want the temporary directory to be somewhere local and not on your network storage. And if you want to share uh, the cache between different OSs, you should also set the sloppiness to just system headers so that if there are differences in headers, um, Ccache will take them into account. And also you can set the, the, the UMask so that the different users uh, won't uh, create files which other users cannot um, write to. Okay, so with all this configuration, um, uh, let's uh, tell a bit how much does it help. And in my experience, it really helps a lot. So if you are just rebuilding, uh, then uh, in my experience, builds can get shorter up to, well, almost the whole time they, they take to build. Um, and uh, in my case, it was up to 95%. If you look at the documentation, then there's also some 
uh, data from the Zcash maintainers where they compiled the Zcash itself using the cache. And you can see that uh, with um, specific uh, configurations, it was up to almost 150 times faster than without Zcash. So this is really a lot. Okay, so I think that's enough about Zcash. I hope I convinced you to start using it, if you can. And uh, let's say a few words about uh, other tools that a developer can need to to really thrive. And uh, I, I know what uh, every developer could use, especially with uh, May already knocking on our doors. And I think uh, all of us could use some ice cream. And I'm not only speaking about uh, ice cream, the dessert. I'm also speaking about ice cream, the tool. So for those of you who aren't aware of it, uh, maybe, you re maybe you heard of this CC. So this CC and ice CC. So ice CC is actually a fork of this CC. Ice cream or ice CC can, it means the same thing here. And uh, this is all for distributed compilation so that you can have a basically farm of machines and you can distribute your build across all the farm. And ice cream differs from this CC with uh, one main feature. It has a central server and uh, this, this guy uh, has some advantages over just this CC. The basic one is that it chooses the fastest free server when it uh, schedules the work and it schedules it using the scheduler. So this, this scheduler is pretty smart. It only uses free resources on your machines. So if uh, you want to, let's say, play some video games while other Mm, developers near you are working, then they having the, the demon uh, of ice cream running on your machine uh, won't mean that uh, it will interfere with your playing games. So the scheduler, the scheduler will see that uh, your CPU load is high and it won't uh, run any builds on your machine. It only uses the free resources. And uh, since it measures the performance, it's uh, it's also good for environments where you have different configurations, stronger and uh, weaker machines. So it will learn how to effectively use all of them. And uh, even if some machines are off, it will still all work. Uh, the scheduler will just uh, distribute work to, to the ones that are online. And Ice Cream also allows you for remote cross compiling. So it automatically sends uh, the tool chain, which you need to compile to the remote hosts. And uh, aside from that, it also has some monitoring capabilities. So there are actually two main ways to monitor how Ice Cream distributes work. And uh, one of the, f the, the, Console ones is Sunday. So this is really a nice tool that, uh, looks like this. Uh, so you can see that uh, you have uh, bars for each host and uh, you have uh, percents and equal signs. So percents are the local jobs and uh, equal signs mean that uh, the jobs on this machine are scheduled from a remote host. Okay, so, oh, and uh, uh, the scheduler will actually um, prefer to schedule work on your local host as it assumes it should be faster than the remote one. Okay, so let's uh, talk about uh, where you can actually run ice cream. So it's also multi-platform, but unfortunately Windows is not supported. Mm, but still, if you have some Linux builds, you can, you can easily use it. So let's uh, see how it uh, all operates. So you have this central scheduler that the monitors. Uh, Icemon is a, a GUI-based tool for monitoring. They both connect to the scheduler and just read data from it. And then you have the demons that the scheduler uh, sends work to. They all connect to the to a one scheduler, even though they can be the completely different configurations, so one being a Mac OS and the other being a Linux, for instance. 
Okay, so having said that, how do we install the tool? And this is uh, pretty easy as well. So here developers recommend using the system package manager. So there's a package for the daemon. There's also a separate one for the scheduler and yet another one for the monitoring tool, which you actually don't need, but it's, it's uh, cool to sometimes see what's happening. Um, you can also use two schedulers with an automatic fallback if you configure them properly. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, ICC, the basic package, is, uh, uh, is offering you both a client um, which connects to the scheduler to send uh, your work to other hosts and the daemon so that uh, other hosts can set, send the uh, work to your machine. Once we have it installed, we need to configure it. So we need to basically open some ports. Um, other than that, the default uh, settings should work fine. If you want, you can set some variables, like you can you can set a, you can pin a scheduler by its address, and you can also tell the scheduler to keep a connection with a with a customer. Uh, uh, I mean a client. So. And uh, what's crucial for you to succeed with ICC is that uh, all the hosts should be connected with a fast network as uh, the, for the first build, you will need to send the tool chain and also you will have to send binary files back and forth. So that's that. Uh, and uh, the scheduler always should have uh, dedicated resources as uh, the latency on the scheduler it's, uh, is greatly, um, it has great impact on the, on the performance of the overall system. Okay, so how can you actually start using it? Uh, so by, to use it by default, all you need to do is uh, to put the binary directory in your path. And then with, if you want to, to use it with CMake, you need to do the same thing that you did with, uh, with Ccache. So first you look for the binary and if it's found, you set it as the launch compiler rule. And uh, so, so at this moment, uh, you could ask yourself a question, how do I use both? And this is an excellent question. So this is pretty easy, actually. Uh, if you remember the prefix command I it said, I mentioned earlier, you can just set it to ICC. So this way, if you call Ccache, it will first look if you have uh, uh, the, the built results ready. And if not, it will call ICC and then it will distribute the build across your network. And uh, so Ccache should, should be before ICC and PATH for this to work if you want to use all, both of them. And uh, speaking about how much uh, ICC can help you, here's a comment from a developer of Firefox. So. Uh, they basically just uh, installed ICC and uh, run a build with it. And uh, you can see that uh, they basically cut uh, down the build time by 75%. So it's quite a lot. In many cases, uh, you can see at least 20% faster builds and uh, your local machine will also be more responsive during builds. So Mm, the shorter build times aren't the only benefit you will have. Okay, so we spoke uh, enough about ice cream, and now let's uh, let's mention what alter alternatives you have, especially if you want to use it also on Windows. So the bad news is that uh, there's a paid one. I mean, it's it's a good news that there is one, but uh, I, and I would recommend you to use Incredibuilt if you if you're on Windows, but you will have to pay for it. Uh, on the plus side, and also it also works for, uh, on Linux. And uh, aside from just building, it can also be used to distribute your test jobs. So this can be pretty handy to shorten your overall CI/CD pipeline. And yet another alternative is SC Cache, and this is Mozilla's uh, 
alternative to both Zcash and Ice Cream. So actually, it's a it's a cache that also supports distributed compilation for C, C++, C++ Rust, and and VCC. And it works on Windows, Linux, and macOS. But unfortunately, it's not production ready yet. So I'm curious what will come of this tool in some time. But enough about uh, just fast builds. Uh, let's also say a few words about uh, the build environments. And uh, to have portable build environments is a, is a great benefit as uh, now you can, if you have, you can easily make sure that everyone in your team is building the same way and you have reproducible builds. So one of the ways to provide it is VMs, but this, uh, so, so basically you provide a VM with all the, with the tool chain already pre-installed and you basically just give users uh, the VMs and, uh, and uh, tell them to run it, uh, to, to run the builds on them. But this may be less than pleasant to, to use as uh, if it's not their developer VMs, but uh, just used for building, then it's not that uh, easy to set up your environment in the best way. So maybe let's look for other alternatives. And one of them is containers. So this is a, a trendy topic always, and they are also faster and smaller than VMs. So that's a pro, but uh, unfortunately the containers like, uh, like uh, Docker often don't really pair well with, with using different uh, tool chains and uh, switching between them is easy, but it could be better. So actually let's look at some other alternatives. And uh, one of the alternatives is Nix. And Nix is basically a, a package manager and there's also a whole operating system built uh, uh, around it. So the pro is that uh, it operates in user land. You can just, uh, you know, be pl play in your, in your shell as usual and uh, just install packages using Nix, similarly to how brew is being used. You can also pin package versions so that you have deterministic uh, builds across time. You can easily upgrade on roll or roll back your, um, packages and manage your, your built environment. You can have separate, uh, several versions of, of, uh, package installed, uh, side by side. Unfortunately, it doesn't run on windows. So, so that's a, a minus and, uh, you, you can use it to easily provide a build, a, a reproducible built environment for your developers. Uh, in a safe way, because uh, installing and upgrading packages uh, won't break other packages, so each one is isolated. Uh, each one is installed in a separate directory. And uh, you also have always consistent state. And it's, it makes it good for environments when you, where you have multiple users on one machine, and they don't even need to have uh, root permissions while still being able to have uh, the exact package versions that they need. And you can uh, have uh, a few different directories with a few different tool chains. So if you want to use separate tool chains, uh, it's, it's really easily easy with Nix. And uh, you can also pair it with uh, DRENV. So DRENV is a tool that allows you to add hooks when you enter a directory. So if you use uh, Nix shell and uh, DRENV, uh, it's uh, really easy to have a uh, reproducible build. So imagine that you are, uh, see, you are changing the directory into, into your project directory or your, or your, um, build directory. And then depending on the configuration, you get the correct tool chain loaded and ready to use. So to, to achieve that, you have to have just two files. And the first one is the envrc file. So this is DRENV's configuration that tells you that it should use Nix and uh, loads the 
environment uh, that you want. And then there's an XSS configuration file, which you which has its own programming language actually, but uh, basically it allows you to specify the packages which you want to have installed and which you want to use. Okay, so uh, it's still not as easy as Homebrew if you want to use it, but it's definitely easier than alternatives like GUIX from GNU. I mean, if you love Lisp and parentheses, then you should love GUIX as well. And it, and GUIX also works with DRENF, but uh, I think uh, Nix is just uh, much more pleasant to use. And I recommend you give it a shot if you can. Okay, so let's switch to yet another topic and it's uh, managing Git hooks. So if you want to ensure that some stuff or checks happen before you commit code, for instance, uh, you can easily use Git hooks for that, but setting them manually is quite a labor and uh, fortunately, there's an app for that. So if you want to have your make your life easier, you should check out the pre-commit tool. That's the name. And uh, there's a GitHub repo with the same name. And uh, to start using it, you basically need to just uh, install the hooks uh, by typing pre-commit install and have a configuration file so the tool knows what to install. And the configuration file can look like so. So in this case, uh, we specify a YAML file with the repositories uh, that we want to grab the hooks from. And then we specify what hooks exactly do we want to run before commit. In our case, uh, we check that no large files are committed, that there's no byte order mark, uh, that the casing and, uh, is proper, that we are not committing with merge conflicts in the tree and that we're not committing to master. So here you can see that we all not only have a, a hook, but also pass it some arguments. We can also check the trailing white space. If you are using get it for code reviews, that then uh, often uh, it, it stands out if you have incorrect trailing white spaces. So they, they are really intensively colored and uh, oftentimes reviewers tend to uh, focus on those instead of reviewing uh, more serious issues because those are more visible. By having this hook, uh, you can just remove the, the problem altogether. And you can specify multiple repositories. So there is one for Clang format and you can also pass your, your favorite arguments to it if the default Clang format file is not good for you. There's also a CMake format tool. So if you wonder how to format CMake files, I guess this is the way to go. And uh, you can also exclude some directories from running the hooks. So for instance, you, they won't bother formatting your third party dependencies. And uh, that's it about pre-commit. So let's switch to yet another aspect and let's talk about uh, packaging your code. And here I would like to introduce you my barbaric friend uh, called Conan. And uh, even though for all of you Lord of the Ring, uh, Ring uh, fans, uh, even though Conan won't let you have his axe, it's uh, still pretty helpful. So let's say a few words about uh, what it is. So basically it's a package manager for C++. It's written in Python and uh, it's like all other system or not system package managers, uh, but it also supports uh, tool chains. So basically it downloads sources of your dependencies and then builds them. But if you are using a common uh, configuration or one that already has uh, have uh, some binaries, then instead of downloading sources, it will use those pre-built binaries to make your build faster. And uh, to specify your dependencies, which Conan should grab, you all you need to do is provide a Conan file. So here you specify the dependencies, their versions. You can also give a range here. You can specify that they belong to some channel like testing or stable if you want. You can specify options for the dependencies. So in our case, we can say that, uh, well, the CPP REST SDK should, should be built as a shared library. 
and you can specify the generators that Conan should uh, mm, run to, to generate the files that you will use during the build. So in our case, uh, we use uh, the two CMake ones that will be the probably main ones in, in Conan 2.0, which is upcoming. So the CMake depths basically creates you config files and the toolchain ones uh, creates you a CMake toolchain, which you can then use with, with CMake. I'll, I'll return to that later. And to integrate with the CMake depths uh, with Conan, uh, with CMake, actually all you need to do is to just uh, seamlessly add it uh, to your CMake lists. So here we just add the binary directory to the CMake prefix path so that we, when we are looking for a packet using the config file, it will see the files that uh, the, the, our generator created. And uh, then we can just link to the target like with any other files. If you've ever used Conan with some other um, generators like uh, the old CMake one, then it probably looks a bit different because you're, you should be accustomed to the Conan basic setup targets or another invocation. But that's uh, but Conan is actually moving away from that convention, and uh, it goes into this direction of seamless integration that you see here. But this is all work in progress, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed for them. Um, okay, so that's about CMake and Conan. Let's uh, state a few words about how you can actually consume packages because Conan not only supports CMake, you can also use it in Make, Auto Tools, and many other, um, so like Visual Studio, Qt, and, and whatever you want, basically. Um, and it's easy to add your own way of consuming, your own build system for consuming Conan packages. Um, and... Uh, here we can, so if you want to use the CMake depths and used other CMake generators in the past, the depths one is actually similar and based upon the find package one. So that's, so this can give you a similar experience. Okay, so this is about consuming. Let's also say a few words about packaging using Conan and uh, it, it offers you helpers for common build systems. So basically you can grab any library or um, C++ project you want and uh, it can either already have a Conan package or you can pretty easily use the helpers that Conan offers to create a package on your own. And uh, to do it, uh, basically, if the C if if you deal with a CMake package or a CMake uh, project that uh, uses uh, installation supports CMake installation, then all you need to do is just specify the libraries that you want to package, and then basically just configure the CMake and run install, so it will automatically build your project and install it as well. And then, if, and and you're done. So basically, th this is part of a file called uh, ConanFile.py, and uh, you have to create one for for a package that you you want to well create. So this is for CMake. If you are using other systems like AutoTools. Uh, then basically you can just run autoconf and uh, there's also a, a auto tools built environment helper. So then you can just call make and call install and uh, that's that's it. Um, and if, uh, if uh, that's still not uh, good enough for you, then uh, you can use self run to also invoke. Uh, commands uh, like esoteric build commands, git clone, and others. Basically, the package uh, function should then copy the results for you. And um, 
if self run and if if you if you're using an esoteric build system then yeah you have to use the self run and then by self copy you can specify what files should be copied to the the destination package so here we can invoke nmake for instance and uh, yet another snippet shows us that uh, there is a tool that we can use to collect the, the libraries and uh, that's it. So you, you can also basically program the whole building pipeline in Python. So here we check if we want shared uh, libraries or not and we pass a compilation definition if we don't. Okay, so Conan also supports toolchains and uh, CMake supports toolchains as well. So there's the CMake toolchain file um, variable. And while CMake can detect the toolchain for your host, you can also give it a, a file that you created to specify another toolchain. So basically, you can specify the compilers, paths, and some other information, environment, uh, and flags that you want. And um, you can uh, use this uh, toolchain file not only for cross compilation, but also to use another compiler for your host environment. And uh, speaking about that, there are, if you want to use Conan with CMake, uh, you should uh, know Conan profiles. So this is a way to actually uh, pass some um, parameters like the operating system, the compiler with its version, the build type, and uh, some environment flags, and maybe some other options to Conan. And it will use it to build your package if building is needed. And uh, if you have this uh, this uh, profile, then if you use the CMake uh, toolchain generator, then based on the profile, you will get a Conan toolchain CMake file, which you can then pass to CMake so that it uses your toolchain. Unfortunately, this doesn't contain all the required settings yet, at least last I checked. So I hope before Conan gets its, uh, it, it's pretty new stuff. So I hope once Conan 2.0 gets released, it will all work uh, just fine. And uh, fortunately, Conan describes how to cross compile in containers uh, on its, uh, in its documentation. So if you're curious, uh, I can only send you there and uh, they should provide you all the information that you need. And having said that, let's also talk about uh, another aspect of packaging, which is CPAC. So if you just want to package using CMake and not Conan, then uh, Basically, CMake offers you this built-in utility called CPAC that can generate you both source and binary packages. And it also, it, it offers you many different flavors of binary packages and they use uh, many common options. So uh, if you want to add new output formats, it's pretty easy. Well, you still need to set some format specific variables, but uh, there is a pretty good common baseline. And uh, what actually CPAC can create for you, it can spit out uh, NSYS installers for Windows. It can provide you with DMG archives for macOS, and it also can provide you with uh, DEB or RPM um, packages on supported platforms. And uh, it's all pretty easy to actually enable once you have a proper installation written in CMake. And uh, another alternative, or maybe two alternatives to packaging, are app image and flat pack. So those two are basically ways to package uh, Linux applications in a portable manner. So it boils down to building it using some old version of uh, glibc. If you're familiar with uh, maybe building Python wheels, it should uh, remind you of many Linux, many Linux containers. 
And uh, basically, those are both an app image and flat pack offer you uh, self contained libraries. So you can then distribute them and they should work on many, many Linux flavors. And uh, I think uh, we are getting uh, to the end of the presentation. So I have uh, yet another nice tool that you can use if you, if, if you like uh, nice things. So if you want, uh, if you're looking for a nicer replacement of sudo, then you can try out pretty please, so which offers you this, this, uh, pretty garden. So while also asking you for the, the root password. And if you are hungry for more, uh, then basically you should try out uh, the book that Piotr and I wrote. It's already, it's already published for not even a week now. So we had our release date on April 23rd. And in this book, you can find more on building and packaging. We also have some uh, more architecture like uh, chapters uh, like uh, for design for architectural patterns for c plus plus 20 features also for cloud native and microservices and achieving various qualities in your software like making it performant or testing it correctly so uh, we're really happy to, to present it to you. And if you want, you can uh, reach out to, to me or Piotr um, after the presentation, and we will try to get you some, some discount codes if you want uh, to, to actually buy it. You can also go to PACT's website for a free sample and uh, subscribe to, to have open access to it. So I guess that's, that's it. And uh, now I'm ready for your questions and I would like to thank you for uh, listening to me today.